Hey everyone, before the episode begins, I'd like to ask you all a quick favor. If you enjoy the podcast, it would be great if you could head over to Apple Music, hit that subscribe button, and drop a five-star review. It really helps out our show. Thanks for listening, guys, and without further ado, let's begin. The story of the Einfeld poltergeist, which inspired the 2016 horror film The Conjuring 2, held the nation spellbound and became one of the most famous supernatural cases in history. It involved strange voices, levitation, flying objects, furniture being moved through the air, cold breezes, and more. And while some call it a hoax, Others consider it to be one of the most witnessed cases of supernatural activity to date. So which is it? A hoax? Simply a series of two young girls' pranks? Or did something otherworldly really visit the northern London suburb of Einfeld? Join me for this week's episode as we explore the mysterious case of the Einfeld poltergeist. I'm Jaden McKell, and you're listening to Straight Up Enigmas. It all began in Einfeld, London, in 1977, when Peggy Hodgson, a single mother of four children, heard loud noises coming from her daughter's bedroom. When she went to tell her daughters, Margaret, 12, and Janet, 11, to settle down and go to sleep, she found them huddled in the corner with terrified expressions on their faces. Janet told her mom that the chest of drawers had started moving toward the bedroom door. Peggy began to argue, telling her daughters they were being silly when she witnessed the drawers moving in the direction of the door by an invisible force, almost as if some supernatural presence were trying to trap the girls in the room. When she went to try and push back against the dresser, it wouldn't budge. Terrified, the Hodgson family ran across the street to ask for help from the neighbors, Vic and Peggy Nottingham. When Vic went into the house to investigate, he too said he heard strange noises coming from around the home. The Hodgsons called the police, and even though one officer claimed to have seen a chair move clear across the room, they concluded it was not police business. According to the family, that was just the beginning of what would become their nearly 18-month haunting. Hello, all you curious creatures out there. I'm Amber A. And I'm Andrew McKay, and welcome into The Portal, a place where we discuss all things lost, unexplained, and straight up strange. Ancient lost history, cryptozoology, worldwide myths and legends are all things to expect when you dive into The Portal. Like the time we covered the strange case of giant humanoid swimmers in Siberia's Lake Baikal, or the terrifying legend of the Braxton County Monster, who stalked the hills of West Virginia. Oh, and don't forget about the enduring mystery of Egypt's lost underworld. We dig it all, so join us every week for a brand new adventure into some of the world's lesser known unexplained phenomena, cryptic creatures, and historical mysteries. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and anywhere you get your podcasts. And of course, at intotheportal.com, your gateway to the bizarre. So come join us. The only question is, will you peer into the portal? We didn't understand what was happening, Margaret would later tell reporters. We went through periods where we just couldn't believe what really happened. It was frightening. We didn't like to be on our own in the house or anything. 
When the strange incidents continued, Peggy decided to call a popular UK publication, The Daily Mirror, to come and investigate the supposed supernatural occurrences. But when the reporter arrived, the house sat silent for hours. It wasn't until the reporter was about to leave that a Lego brick suddenly flew through the air, hitting him above the eye. He still had the mark a few days later. It was around then that the Daily Mirror called the Society for Psychical Research, SPR, who sent Maurice Gross and Guy Playfair to investigate the case. During his stay at the house, Gross reported he witnessed more than 2,000 different incidents of supernatural activity. According to Janet, these incidents included furniture turning over, cups filling with water, fires igniting, voices, and levitation. One night, a curtain next to Janet's bed even wrapped itself around her neck in the middle of the night. It was also during this time that the supposed poltergeist started speaking through Janet. She would often go into a trance-like state where she would speak in a deep, scratchy voice, claiming to be the ghost of a man named Bill Wilkins, who had died in the house years before. It was later proven that a man by that name was once a resident of the home and did, in fact, die of a hemorrhage while sitting in the living room. The ghost would reportedly talk through Janet for hours at a time. Gross and Playfair also noted curious whistling and barking noises coming from Janet's general direction. Although Playfair maintained the haunting was genuine, and wrote later in his book, This House is Haunted, The True Story of a Poltergeist, that an entity was to blame for the disturbances, he often doubted whether Janet was telling the truth. According to Playfair, Bill, the ghost speaking through Janet, displayed a habit of suddenly changing the topic, which was a habit Janet also had. Throughout the 18-month period, a number of other paranormal researchers visited the house, including famed demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren, who stated they were convinced that something supernatural was responsible for the strange happenings inside the house. Skeptic Joe Nichols said that demonologist Ed Warren was notorious for exaggerating and even making up incidents in such cases, often transforming a haunting case into one of demonic possession. What about those who claim Janet and her siblings were behind the elaborate hoax and simply faking their demonic symptoms? We'll look at criticisms of the paranormal investigation right after this. Hey, this is Heath. And this is Daphne. And we're the hosts of Going West, a true crime podcast. Where we discuss various murders, disappearances, and serial killers. Each week, we go into the gory details of a new case. Like episode 5, which is about Dorothy Jane Scott, a single mother who was receiving threatening phone calls by a stalker and then mysteriously disappeared. Or the terrifying case of Dayton Leroy Rogers, the most prolific serial killer in Oregon history. You can find us on our Instagram at Going West Podcast or check out our website, goingwestpodcast.com. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Stitcher, and Spotify. So make sure to check out our episodes and leave a review. Everybody in the world, keep it real and stay weird. Cheerio. The psychical researcher, Renee Haynes, questioned the alleged poltergeist voice speaking through Janet at the second International SPR conference at Cambridge in 1978, where video cassettes from the case were examined. The SPR investigator, Anita Gregory, stated the Einfeld poltergeist case had been overrated, characterizing several episodes of the girls' behavior as suspicious, and speculated that girls had staged some incidents for the benefit of reporters seeking a sensational story. John Beloff, a former president of the SPR, investigated and suggested Janet was practicing ventriloquism. Both Beloff and Gregory came to the conclusion that Janet and Margaret were playing tricks on the investigators. A 
American magician Milbourne Christopher briefly investigated, failed to observe anything that could be called paranormal, and was dismayed by what he felt was suspicious activity on the part of Janet. Christopher would later conclude that the poltergeist was nothing more than the antics of a little girl who wanted to cause trouble and who was very, very clever. Ventriloquist Ray Allen visited the house and concluded that Janet's male voices were simply vocal tricks. Joe Nickel, the same skeptic who spoke out against Ed Warren, examined the findings of paranormal investigators and criticized them for being overly credulous. When a supposedly disembodied demonic voice was heard, Playfair noted that as always, Janet's lips hardly seem to be moving. Perhaps the most famous piece of evidence in the case is a fast photo sequence that supposedly recorded poltergeist activity on moving film for the first time. The series of pictures shows 11-year-old Janet supposedly levitating off her bed. Paranormal investigator Melvin Harris demonstrated how the photos actually reveal the girl's pranking. Harris dubbed the photographed levitations gymnastics, commenting, It's worth remembering that Janet was a school sports champion. Nickel even created a sort of comic illustration based on one of the pictures, where he labeled Janet's bed as a trampoline. In 2015, Deborah Hyde commented that there was no solid evidence for the Einfeld poltergeist. The first thing to note is that the occurrences didn't happen under controlled circumstances. People frequently see what they expect to see, their senses being organized and shaped by their prior experiences and beliefs. Two SPR experts actually caught the children one day bending spoons, attempting to make it look like the entity had done it. In fact, Janet admitted that she and her siblings made up a few events just to see if the investigators would catch them. Later, she said about 2% of the events in the house were faked, which leads most critics to believe that 100% of the events were fabricated. To me, while there does seem to be some evidence of fakery, I believe that some kind of negative energy was in that house. Dozens of witnesses claimed to have had supernatural experiences in the house. Investigators, neighbors, reporters, and even a policewoman. I understand paranormal investigators embellishing a few things, and I even understand reporters exaggerating a few details for a sensational story. But what would neighbors have to gain by making up stories? And I can't imagine a policewoman stating her opinion on the supernatural activity lightly. Her statements might have put her career on the line. Just because the girls faked a few of the events doesn't mean we should proverbially throw the baby out with the bathwater. An otherworldly entity could have entered the Hodgson's home. If that entity left after a few months, maybe the girls just started missing the spotlight and found an easy way to become the center of attention again. Almost 40 years later, Janet and Margaret say they've tried to move on from the traumatic time in their life. However, Margaret would later tell reporters, It stays with you, every step of the way. It's just like a death, really. It gets a little bit easier as time goes on, but the fear and the memories of it and what happened never leave you. What's your take on the Einfeld poltergeist? Was it all just a hoax or a supernatural entity of some kind? Find us on Instagram at Straight Up Enigmas or Twitter at Straight Enigmas and let us know. You can also contact us through email at straightupenigmas at gmail.com or through our website straightupenigmas.home.blog. If you like the show, please remember to hop onto Apple Music to give us a five-star rating. It really helps the podcast. 
Tune in next Tuesday for a brand new episode of Straight Up Enigmas.